last week we were already we're in chapter 13 he read uh, the same chapter again and the reason why is because we talked last week about the dragon the beast and the false prophet and uh, we got to this point I didn't spend a whole lot of time in that but I want to hit that again and talk about something that when it comes to the end time prophecy and the book of Revelation one of the most popular subjects out there and that's what what we call the mark of the beast okay and so that comes up a whole lot in fact, I think I told you about before where Valerie and I went on a vacation and that uh, service, I think uh, Sunday night or something, we popped into this church and got there in the morning and they had Sunday school and the teacher never showed up. So they're scrambling, trying to figure out who's going to teach. And they almost talked this lady into getting up and teaching the class. Uh, and I was really ready to say, hey, you know what? I'll preach <laughs> something and I, because they would have left because they had no, <laughs> you know, guidelines it seems like but anyway some guy got up there and said you know what I'll talk about the mark of the beast and he just picked this uh, you know simple old topic to talk about and got up there and just talked about everything that going on in the news and what he had read in books about the mark of the beast and no real spiritual application but it was just interesting to him so he thought hey I'll just get up and talk about that and it is it's an interesting subject it's always been something that people have talked about and what is this mark and there's been all kinds of speculation and, uh, and things that go with it. So I want to talk about that a little bit this afternoon. First thing I want you to notice, and in, in, this is the title of the message. Uh, well, I'll get to the title in a second. <laughs> but the first thing I want you to notice is it doesn't just say the mark of the beast. Originally the title was going to be the mark of the beast and then I got to thinking, well, there's more involved here. Because actually what it's what it says, and this is the name of the, the message, the mark, the name, and the number of the three things. All right. So let's look at chapter 13, verse 16. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So that's interesting to me that he mentions these three things. It's not just this mark of the beast. And uh, first it says, you know, it talks about the mark. And I think about a mark and I think of like a logo, right? The mark uh, of something. You think about a seal. Uh, in fact, uh, the inscription on coins, you know, the print, the image that's on a coin historically when that first got big in the Roman wor world or whatever, and they had that image. We know it was already on there because Jesus said, hey, look whose subscription is on the, the coin, whose image is it? And he said it was Caesar. So we know that was already there. But at some point in the early uh, church, uh, there are records that people thought that the coins themselves were receiving the mark of the beast because no one can buy, sell, trade unless they have these coins. And they had the Im an, an image printed on there. And uh, anyway, I'll get into some of that here in a minute, but a mark makes me just think of just some kind of logo, right? But then it also says uh, the name and it says the, uh, or the, or the number. So look at uh, chapter 14 and verse nine, back to the idea of the mark. It says his mark, obviously it's the beast mark. So the mark of the beast is, uh, makes sense here, but 14 verse nine, and the third angel followed, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. So we see there that he, that's receiving his mark or the beast's mark. And, uh, and so then, this is just introduction. I'm trying not to give too much information yet. Okay, 15 verse 2, same thing. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Chapter 20, verse 4. We're going to, several of these verses we're going to hit more than once because we're going to look at different aspects of the verse. But 20, verse 4 says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment uh, was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither has re had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived 
and reign with Christ a thousand years. So it's all those times talking about him, and it says his mark or the uh, the mark. Uh, also, we saw the mark of his name. Look at fourteen eleven. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they had no rest, uh, nor they, they had no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark in his name. Uh, I'm sorry, the mark of his name. So the mark of his name. Uh, and then 16.10 is where we see the actual word, the mark of the beast. Okay, 16.10. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed uh, their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their... Am I in the right place? 16 verse 10. That ain't right. You read it to me, and I, I didn't stop you. <laughs> okay. I try to check my verses on the way up here, but uh, anyway, somewhere, Mark of the Beast is in there. So, uh, so anyway, the point that I'm making there is just that there's lots of different names in there. We just always call it Mark of the Beast. Just like I pointed out that we always say the Antichrist. The Antichrist is not actually in there. Uh, okay, I'm getting a message here. What is it? 16.2. Sixteen two, and the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them that worshipped his image. So a lot we can take from those verses, and like I said, we'll be revisiting uh, some of those here in a minute. But I think it's interesting that you have not just the mark, you know, but then it also talks about the name of the beast. We don't know what the name is. Uh, you know, I remember. Uh, there were some people throwing around this idea of uh, Trump, you know, the last Trump, you know, <laughs> I guess. And, and he had these coins. I've mentioned this before uh, whenever he declared uh, Jerusalem the capital of Israel. And he had, they had, there's this coin that came out with his image on it. And it said his name, although I think it called him King Sirius, Cyrus or something like that. You know, anyway, he's the one that let them go back into Israel after Babylonian captivity. And, uh, and then, I don't know, probably some kind of number on there or something. So I, I began thinking in my mind, like, you know, I don't understand all this. I don't claim to, but uh, there seems to be three different uh, items involved here. Maybe you could get all three of them. Let's say you had a logo that was, that was marked upon you, stamped upon you, whatever. I'll get to that in a minute. And, uh, and then that logo of the image, maybe it's the, maybe it's a, some kind of emblem that represents the, that image that they're all worshiping. You know, by the way, the image that they worship, it says that they worship the image. It says that they worship the beast and it says they worship the dragon. So really, it's all the same thing. They understand all this power is coming from the dragon, which is Satan. And ultimately, any idol worship is worshiping Satan, right? But in this case, they're literally worshiping Satan and his the beast, which Satan gave power. And then... Uh, and, you know, they're, and so they're worshiping his, his name and this image that they set up. It's all related. And so in this image, perhaps, you know, there's some logo that ties in. The, I mean, that's just my, my, my imagination going here. And that's the image. And then there is a, a name. I don't know what the name is, but that name, you know, represents, hey, this is what you're worshiping, right? This is what you're, you're giving allegiance to. And then there's this number of its, of its name. And, uh, of course, look at that passage there in uh, chapter 13, verse 18 says, Here is wisdom. Every time in prophecy you see that, especially in Daniel, you get this idea that this is a mystery. People don't understand what this is. But when that time comes and they receive wis the understanding of that, then they have wisdom. And so oftentimes it's saying, uh, you know, once you figure this out, now you have the wisdom. So here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is six hundred three score and six. Now I'll talk about that number here just for a second. Still in introduction, all right? The, uh, the introduction will be just as long or longer than the message. But uh, think about the many, many uh, actions that people have taken because of this number. Six, 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 right? And it's interesting, we, very little information is given upon that. We, all we know is 600, 
three score and six. That's the number that's given, and it says, hey, whoever has understanding. And I would say at this point, nobody has understanding of what that number is or what is, what is referenced here. A lot of people might think that they do, but some people are just so afraid of it. You know, there's an actual phobia. You, you know, you heard all these different phobias, arachnophobia and all that people can have. Well, see if you can figure this one out. Hexacosoi, hexaconota, hexaphobia. <laughs> I messed that up, but it's a Greek word. You can see the hex in there, right? 600, 660, or 660 and 6. You know, there's a fear of that number, 666. I was reading a story about somebody who was actually qualifying for a marathon. There was like somebody like way up there could, had, could have done a good job at it. Qualify, they were going to qualify for a marathon, but their bib number was 666 and they wouldn't participate. <laughs> and so some people have a fear of this number. Oh, 666, I can't, I can't do it. I was joking this morning and, and uh, you, we sang a song from 667 or 668, I can't remember what it was. And this morning I said, uh, we're going to sing 666. And we sang, it's a good song, it's a good song. But one reason lot nobody sings it is because they don't want to turn to that page number. There's like this uh, superstition that people have from it. In Arabic, look it up for yourself. In Arabic, the numbers look like Monster Energy, energy Drink logo. So have you ever seen that fi the film? There's this lady and she's standing and she's, uh, she's explaining to everybody. Now, if you look here, and she's showing the Arabic and she's saying, Monster Energy Drink. I would never drink those because... It looks like that 666 uh, emblem. Okay, this is the kind of stuff that people, you know, think about when they see this and they're scared. There are people who won't take part, uh, take part in events that took place on June 6, 2006. A lot of people canceled their, their marriage plans <laughs> because it was on 666. Okay, and so they didn't want to do that. Uh, people won't take uh, uh, place in events. I already talked about the marathon. Uh, I have heard of people who the buy something and the cashier rings it all up and it comes <laughs> to six sixty six and they say, "Hey, let me give you another penny or something like that," because they don't want to do that. My mom's shaking her head, and I'm like, "Hey, uh, this is this is this is superstition." <laughs> what about Psalm sixty six verse six? I mean, is there some? <laughs> what about Isaiah six? Verse 6. Don't turn there. There's it's no significance at all. <clears throat> but you understand that this mark of the beast has become a, kind of an obsession with people on the uh as far as it you know goes with the end times prophecy. And we don't know, we certainly don't want to accept the mark of the beast, right? So anytime you see that, you're like, I am not going to do anything related with that. Now, religious interpretations of the of this number. Because everyone makes a big deal of the number, not so much the name. We don't know what the name is, not so much the, uh, 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 what did I say, the name, the, uh, uh, the number, or the mark, okay? Not so much the actual mark, which would be, this one. see, most people just put it all together. Like, you receive that mark, it is 666, they'll say, or, uh, or some kind of a uh, reference to that. All right, the Seventh-day Adventists. I don't know how familiar you are with that group, but they're really big. They're really insistent that you don't uh, go to church on Sunday, right? And Iola, one time we got out of service and went, and everybody's car had some kind of pamphlet in the underneath the um, windshield wiper. I'm like, what in the world? Somebody like, you know, selling items or something? And they went and put it on all the cars while we're in church, and he looked it up. Nope, it was a Seventh-day Adventist church that went out on Sundays, putting it in all the car doors, saying that you shouldn't be worshiping on Sunday. And uh, I got this out of Wikipedia, and it says, Seventh-day Adventists say that the mark of the beast refers to a future, universal, legally enforced Sunday sacredness. All right, here's a direct quote. Those who reject God's memorial of creatorship, the, Sabbath, uh, the Bible Sabbath, choosing to worship and honor Sunday in full knowledge that it is not God's appointed day of worship, will receive the mark of the beast. That's some, some, uh, some of their material, their writings that they have. That's a direct quote. Then it also says, The Sunday Sabbath is purely a child of the papacy. It is the mark of the beast. And so they literally think that if you worship on Sunday, that you are taking part in the mark of the beast. That's kind of interesting. A common preterist view. Preterism believe, is the idea that 
the uh, all these end time events prophecy has already come to pass. You know, most of them think, you know, in the first century it was all uh, it was already done. Okay, a common preterist view of the mark of the beast, focusing on the past, is the stamped image of the emperor's head on every coin of the Roman Empire. I was talking about that a minute ago. The stamp on the hand or in the mind of all, without uh, which no one can buy or sell. But again, Jesus talks about the image and subscription on the coin, right? So uh, he obviously still used coins, even though it had an image on it. And he still paid his taxes, and he still did all that. All right, often it's also mentioned the number six is the number of man. How many have ever heard that? And 666 is the number of man. That's what they say. Well, actually, look at that verse again. Chapter 13, verse 18. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. In my mind, here's what I understand this to mean, okay? If every man was given a number, right? How about, I'm not saying our social security is the mark of the beast, but how about a social security number? You're assigned a number. This is the number of a man. Somebody brought up at church this morning, because in Sunday school we talked about mark, mark in the Bible, uh, uh, you know, marking, marking yourself and putting marks on people. And anyway, it was a preparation for this, <laughs> but... Uh, Talked about that, and somebody brought up the military. In the military, everybody's assigned a number. In prison, everybody's assigned a, assigned a number, right? So when it says it's the number of a man, I don't think it's talking about, you know, six is some, you know, a numeric, numeric you know, uh, uh, it just always stands for man. I'm sa maybe that case can be made, I don't know, but I think people have just kind of read into that. I think it just means it's the number of a man. It's, it's a, you know, this is his, the number that's assigned to him. Maybe at that point, people will have numbers assigned. Like I said, we already do, social security numbers and, and uh, what have you. At this point, uh, people will be numbers. I, I got an idea. Facial recogni recognition, <laughs> you know, everybody's assigned a number. That's number 660. <laughs> anyway, so, but there's a number involved. So there's the num, but this is the number of the beast. His number is 603 score and six. And, uh, and then he's also got an image or a, uh, a mark, you know, that, that is given. So anyway, this is some interesting ideas. Now, a little bit more introduction here. Historic marks on foreheads. You know, it may seem, might seem weird. Not really. If you, if you really start thinking about it, it's not so weird. But I remember as a kid thinking it was a little weird, like, to think that we're going to go around with marks on our foreheads. Or not, I mean, I'm not going to, but you know what I'm saying? Like people will go around with marks on their foreheads. But if you think about it throughout history, you know, the Hindus have what's called a talaka. I don't know how you pronounce it, which is an ash paste. And it's got three lines. Maybe you've seen that. Three lines. I don't know. The three represent something. And they'll do that. Uh, when people go into these countries where they do that, or they'll put a little dot on their head. The Hindus, you've seen the little dot. Sometimes it's a jewel but often it's just a, uh, an, a, some ashes and stuff mixed together, some paint, and they'll put a little dot there for religious purposes. Now, oftentimes a visitor will go to their country, and they'll go to their holy place or whatever, and they'll just take the dot and say, hey, I want to be respectful to the country and all that stuff, and they'll just you know, go into that. Now, I'm not saying it's the mark of the beast by any means, but here's something I don't ever want to do. I don't ever want to be guilty of going into a country it's kind of like eating meat, sacrificing the idols, you know what I mean? I don't ever want to go and just dress like I'm part of another religion that believes something else, you know. Go ahead, suffer the persecution or whatever, but don't ever, you know, just try to fall into their, their customs. It's real easy to do, you know. I remember when we were in Japan, of course, when we first went to J Japan, my family wasn't saved. Uh, and then afterwards, you know, we may have done this a little bit because we were still new in the, in the faith. Uh, and when I say my family, I mean like before, before I met Valerie, and um, and my dad was in the military, so we went to Japan, and we would just for fun take part in some of their customs. Well, you got to be careful because some of those customs have religious, you know, connotations, and you don't want to be involved in that. But uh, but the Hindus have these different marks. There's other sects that have the the red dot, and it, I was reading about that, and it's talking about ashes. Made me think of what. Christians, some people that call themselves Christians have Ash Wednesday where the priest puts the ash mark on their 
their head. And there's a mark, you know, that the priest gave them. I could see where, like, in the Reformation, they probably would have said, oh, look, the, the Pope is putting marks on people. That's the mark of the beast, you know. But they put a cross on the head, and that was supposed to be a sign of their religious uh, repentance and stuff like that. Well, look at Matthew 23. Matthew 23, verse 5. You familiar with the phylactery? A phylactery, the way I understand it, I, I could have looked at this up a little bit more, but the way I understand it, it's a box in which Scripture is placed. And then that is play, put oftentimes on their forehead. And the Jews today even do that. If you go to so-called Jews, if you go to Israel, you'll see some people, or even in certain, probably here in Kansas City, over by Menorah, Hospital, and that uh, area, you'll probably see these things. You know, something or have it on their, their house or whatever, little box that has a scripture in it. And it's supposed to look, you know, you ask them, well, what does that scripture say? I don't know. <laughs> Just, I got a box with scripture in it. But they would wear this on their heads. And look at chapter 23 of Matthew, verse 5. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. Well, those phylacteries, like I said, were something that they would wear on their head so that they could be seen of men. So, you know, it's throughout history, there's often been times where people would wear certain things on their head. Look at Ezekiel 9 real quickly. Ezekiel 9, this is, a, this is all dealing with prophecy, and you'll find that this lines up really well. I'm not saying it's the exact event, but lines up really well with the marking uh, sealing of the 144,000. And in this, uh, in this chapter, look at verse 4. The Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh, and that cry for all the abominations uh, that, uh, that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others, he said, uh, in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Uh, then they began at the ancient men which were before the house, And so you see this idea that these people, everyone that had the mark was spared. These were the ones who grieved for the city and all. And then, and then everyone that didn't have the mark, they were destroyed. And so this fits really well with the, mar the ceiling of the 144,000. Look at Revelation 7-2. And I can't help but wonder, to be honest, because I believe that the, the, the beast, the Antichrist, if you will, when this person comes on the scene, I believe he's going to be a, a religious leader. And so uh, probably even telling people, hey, there's some things in the Bible that are true. And I wouldn't be surprised at all if he would deceive people who think that they're Christians into saying, hey, look, we're sealing you so you'll be protected. You know, why not go to Ezekiel 9, you know, and try to convince them that there's this sealing. And so I could see people almost thinking that they're being sealed to protect themselves, you know, so they're they're lining up with this religious uh, leader, uh, but they're actually denying the true the true Lord. That's just a thought of mine. But Revelation 7, look at verse 2. And I saw another angel descending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And so we see that again in 14, verse uh, 1. Chapter 14, verse 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb... Uh, stood on, I'm sorry, yeah, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 140 and 4,000, having the Father's name written in their forehead. Now, isn't that interesting? What did they have in their forehead? The Father's name, right? What's the, is, what, what are the people receiving that receive the mark of the beast? The mark or his name or his number, right? So there's the name of the beast in their foreheads. I just find that kind of interesting. But here we have this, uh, you know, this concept of people putting marks on their forehead and being seen. But probably even more common than the forehead thing, although that's I clearly seen that that's, that's something that happens, but it says, or in their hand, right? So 
it's, it makes logical sense that the forehead and the hand would be something that you would want to be on people that has the easiest access. You know, I have a jacket on right now. If uh, it was in any other part of my body, it might be kind of hard to reveal that. But on my hand or on my forehead, it's real easy. We go into the doctor's office to get a visit. And now with a COVID thing, they want to check everybody's temperature. So you just walk up to this little thing and it, and it points at your forehead and it tells you what your temperature is and you go on. And, uh, and you can see how convenient that's, that would be, you know. Hey, are you gonna, are we gonna let him in the store? We're gonna let him in the store where he can buy stuff? First, you, you, know, you gotta get scanned. Uh, it's definitely, uh, you can see where that could, that could happen. Now, here's an interesting thought. What about this, uh, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Let me go ahead and start on my points here. I got three points, all right? Number one is this. Here's what we know. Here's what we know about these things. Here's three things that we know. Number one, this forcing people to take this mark will be universal. It will be universal. Now, I struggled with that a little bit thinking, well, where does it actually say everybody in the whole world is going to be made to do this? Right? You kind of have to read between the lines. But look at chapter 13, verse 16. Again, a lot of these verses we've already read, but we're going to look for something different in the, these verses. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Okay, it says, uh, uh, you know, all these different people. And if you think about it, comparing Scripture with Scripture, and think about all that we've read in Revelation already, doesn't it seem like there's a world war going on? And there's like world famine. I mean, all these things are involving the whole world. And it says all nations. Look at Matthew 24. Had to make sure that no, no sermon from this series left out Matthew 24. So we, Matthew 24. Look at verses 7 and 8. This is what Jesus says is going to happen at this end time, and, it's, and this is the time we're reading about in Revelation right now. For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they shall deliver you up and all that stuff. So you see this idea like there's this kind of worldwide famine. There's worldwide, you know, wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes in diverse places, you get the idea that this seems to be talking about the whole world, not just Jerusalem and that region. Although, don't get me wrong, most of what we read in Revelation is taking place right there in Jerusalem. All right? That's what's being followed. And when we talk about the two witnesses uh, uh, tonight in Iola, and all that, is, it, it says flat out, in that place, which is called Sodom and Egypt, where the Lord is crucified. And we know that's talking about Jerusalem. And so these are where these things are happening. Now, there are some things that puzzle me where it's talking about the temple and it's talking about different things. And we look at Jerusalem today and say, well, those things haven't happened yet, which is really interesting because they say, oh, everything's happened and he could come at any moment. And I'm thinking, well, I don't see where these things have happened yet. <laughs> We're still waiting for the Antichrist to be revealed and set himself up in the temple and, and all these kinds of things. And they haven't happened yet. And so, uh, uh, that's, that's just kind of an interesting thing. It seems like it's worldwide going on. Now look at Revelation 6, which lines up really well with Matthew 24. Again, we are in chapter 13, so you know, we're uh, kind of a second telling of these events. But the first time we read about these events, chapter 6, verse 8. And of course, all four of these horses that are mentioned is kind of like the rise of the Antichrist and his power and setting up all these things, world war, famine, all that. It says, I looked and behold a pale horse and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with beasts of the earth. And so we see at least a fourth part of the world there uh, being affected, but it sure seems like a lot more than that going on. Look again to Revelation 13. Verse 7. I know this is deep stuff. I hope I haven't lost any, anyone too much. Chapter 13, look at verse 7. And it was given unto him, all right, talking about this beast here, 
is given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So you see where we get the idea of one world government, one world, you know, uh, uh, a one world leader, one world religion and all this. It seems to be universal and, uh, and widespread. OK, number two, things that we know. All those uh, those who are going to receive the, the mark, it will be necessary to have it in order to buy or sell. Look at verse 17 again, chapter 13, verse 17. It will be necessary to buy or to sell. It says, and he gave power, uh, he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead, verse 17, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, look, again, I don't have the wisdom to know exactly what these things are or what that looks like. But I can tell you this. We look at technology today. We look at the events going on in our world. I don't know how anybody could say, you know, that there's ever been a time in history where we're closer to seeing the technology for this to happen. Uh, with things going on right now in our world, we're seeing a push. I mean, even in little old Iola, you can go to some places where they'll say, hey, we're not taking any cash at this point, right? We don't want any cash. We want you to use your credit card because we don't want your germs from the cash. I guess your credit card is cleaner than the cash. <laughs> I don't know, but we don't want to, so we'll take credit card. But see, how, so there's what you say. Hey, we don't want to touch your credit card either. So you know what they'll do? How many people in here have ever bought something from an app on your phone? No, you guys are like, I'm not receiving the mark. <laughs> okay, you have, there's an app on your phone that directs, directly links into your, uh, uh, I'm joking, it's not receiving the mark, okay? But it directly links to your bank. And so you, no one has to touch your card. You don't have to swipe anything. You just hold that up to the scanner. It scans that barcode and boom, it comes in. You know, but what if you don't have your phone on you? So wouldn't it be just more convenient to have a mark that told you, you see what I'm saying? Uh, so there's a, you're not going to be able to buy or sell unless, I keep saying you, none of you guys are going to it, all right? <laughs> but, but, uh, but anybody that wants to buy or sell is going to have to have this. And this is why people that believe that, that we're going through a portion of that, the rising of the Antichrist and pushing the mark of the beast, I do, I believe right uh, during that, this is right at that time of that great tribulation. Okay, right before the Lord comes back, I think it's going to get really bad, and you're going to see this push, and everybody's going to be trying to, you know, survive. Uh, and, and so this is why all the jokes are made about the uh, uh, the bunkers and you know stockpiling up food and all this kind of stuff because they're like, hey, we're not going to be able to buy or or sell during that time. But you know, <clears throat> we just wait to the conclusion on that part. Okay, <laughs> so. Uh, so anyway, it will be necessary to buy or sell. Uh, here's a thing that I have wondered myself. Now, where is this mark or whatever going to be? Now, uh, if you read all those verses that I read, you may have noticed that over and over it says, on the forehead, I mean, I'm sorry, it says in the forehead or in the hand, right? So I looked up all the places in the Bible, maybe not all, probably most of the places in the Bible where it says in the hand. If I pick up this hymnal right here, the hymnal is in my hand. Okay, this is what it talks about. If someone's taking somebody in their hand, they're holding their hand and there's something in their hand. Okay, and so it's so I got to think, well, maybe marks on the inside of the hand, not on the outside like everybody thinks. Maybe it's on the inside of the hand. And then I thought, well, I've also heard people say, well, it's going to be a chip. And so the chip's implanted, and there it's in your hand. And I thought, well, is there any way to prove that when it says in, that's what it means, like inside of your hand? And I don't think there is a way to prove that. In fact, I'm not one that goes back to the Greek and all that kind of stuff, but occasionally I do like to check and see, like, I'm just out of curiosity. If I had a Greek Bible in front of me, would those be the same words? You know, if I had a, a Texas Receptus or whatever. And in and upon are the same word. Now you say, well, it doesn't matter if that's, you know, hey, those Greek scholars, they make mistakes. I agree with you, but let's look at chapter 20. 
Every other place it says in the forehead and in the hand. Chapter 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And uh, they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So here it says, upon the foreheads. You know, Everywhere else it said, in the foreheads. I think it's just interchangeable. Okay? I think it's a mark, something that people can see that identifies maybe a logo or a name or a number and uh, identifies, you know, uh, that they have taken that, that mark and they have agreed to worship the beast or whatever. Which brings me to the last point here. So it'll be universal. It'll be necessary in order to buy or to sell. Here's another thing that we know. It will be tied to the worship of the beast or his image. Okay, it will be tied to that. This is why I'm not superstitious about it. I don't care. I have not received uh, a mark of the beast just because I read, you know, from song number 666 or something like that. It's, it's, I, I can understand somebody having a phobia of that or whatever. That doesn't bother me one bit because I'm not worshiping the beast, right? There's nothing within me that's ever going to give allegiance to and knowingly worship uh, another god. You know, particularly the beast, which I think every Christian will know that that's the beast, right? And everybody will know what's going on here with this uh, with this mark. And uh, look at chapter thirteen, verse four. Again, he gets his power from the dragon. It says in verse four, and they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Okay, and then elsewhere it talks about them uh, worshiping the, the image as well. So look at, uh, look at chapter 14. Receiving the mark is going to identify those who, have got, who are going to have God's wrath poured out on them. Okay, so while the Antichrist is rising up and he's trying to, you know, get everybody on his side or whatever, then this mark is going to represent those who are on his side, those who are able to buy and sell, uh, those who, you know, swore allegiance to him or whatever. Meanwhile, the saints are kind of scattered abroad or whatever, trying to flee into the mountains. And, uh, and, and so this is, the, this is how they're identified. But wait a minute. After... The rapture or the resurrection after the saints are gone right we got the name of the lord in our foreheads the the 144,000, you know are become they come on the earth they've got the name of the lord in their foreheads they're sealed now what are those people with the mark of the beast it's still an identifier but you know what it's going to identify those on whom god's going to pour out his wrath okay so look at chapter 14 Verse 9, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Look at chapter 16, verse 2. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon which worshipped his image. You see how these are all connected, and it's very consistent. So all these people, over and over it talks about these people that have the mark, and they continue to live in the sins, and they don't repent of their sins. It's like they become just total enemies of God, and they, they believe a lie. They're given over to a strong delusion, they don't see, they're completely reprobate, and they're not ever going to come to the Lord, so he's pouring out his wrath on them. But what about those people that didn't receive the mark? Uh, now, uh, my feeling is, and I've expressed this before, my feeling is everybody who didn't receive the mark of the beast and was those who are Christians, uh, or, I mean, who, who believe in, in Christ, are up in the rapture at this point. And I don't see any evidence that anybody from that point on 
um, get saved. Okay, but those people who are in heaven, it's identified in the Bible that they did not receive the mark. Okay, and it points that out. Look at chapter 15, verse 2. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. Look at chapter 20. In verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. You see how this identifier is the fact that they did not receive the, the mark. Okay, so there's a lot of unknowns. There's a mystery. Okay, I think that this is the idea. There's this, there's this mystery. We don't understand what this is. When it comes, people will know. You know, when they're, people are actually receiving it and being told to receive it, they'll understand that, hey, this is, this is the mark of the beast. This is the number of his name. This is, uh, you know, this is giving uh, uh, worship and honor to this image. And so, uh, this is something that we will know whenever that time comes, or, or whoever's here will know. Now, what do we do now, though? What do we do now? Well, my advice is simple. Just don't over-worry about it. <laughs> you worship the Lord. If you're worshiping the Lord, if you have you know, sworn allegiance to Him, and, uh, and you're, not, you're not worried about it, look, don't worry about, don't overly worry. Now, I don't, I'm, not, I'm okay with, Hey, you know, not accepting this anything that would contribute to a one world government and all that kind of stuff. But don't over worry. Like, what are we gonna do? Oh no, the mark. Because you know, I accepted the mark. Uh, it's it's. Don't become superstitious. Don't become paranoid. Uh, don't let it bother you. You just keep serving the Lord. He, if your heart is right and you are saved, child of God, He's not gonna let you take this mark. Okay, and uh, and it's okay to sing song. 666. In fact, we're going to sing that before we leave. <laughs> okay. But just decide that you're never going to deny Christ. Now, look, there's no way a person can lose their salvation. Don't misunderstand me. Okay. But it doesn't matter because in our heart, we're never going to deny Christ. So just decide, hey, I'm never going to deny him. I'm never willingly going to worship anyone or anything else. The Lord is my Lord. You know, he's my God. Uh, I'm going to worship him only and serve him only. And if you got that set in your mind and you've been saved, you're not going to have to worry about all those things to come, all right? All right, you don't have to worry about stack, stockpile and toilet paper either, okay? Lord, take care of you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, your word and, and uh, the truths of your word. We don't understand it all. Lots could happen that we are completely unaware of. We could be like those throughout history have done and uh, assume a lot of things are this mark or, or the Antichrist or... Uh, or the or the image or or whatever, Lord, but help us to just to just know that things will happen as the Bible said in their time. Give us wisdom as those things come that we might watch and we might see signs. And you've told us what many of the signs are to be watching for. Certainly, we have wars, rumors of wars, and we have pestilence. We have all these kinds of things. Help us to just look up, for our redemption draweth nigh. I pray in Jesus' name, Amen.